Today, the latest weapons, coupled with the fighting skill of the American soldier, stand ready, on the alert all over the world, to defend this country, you, the American people, against aggression. This is the big picture, an official television report to the nation from the United States Army. Now, to show you part of the big picture, here is Sergeant Stuart Queen. For 10 years, United States Army forces shared the occupation of Austria with British, French, and Russian units. For most of those 10 years, the Western powers made repeated attempts to end that occupation, to make Austria once again a free and independent nation. Always we were thwarted by the Russian command, Finally, in the spring of 1955, influenced by the prevailing spirit of Geneva, the Russians agreed. The following September, American forces evacuated Austria for new NATO assignments in Italy. They left behind many friends and many pleasant memories. Let's visit Austria on the eve of the evacuation. It is the last week in September 1955 in the American zone of Austria. It is the last week that there will be an American zone in Austria. After more than 10 years of occupation, the American army is pulling out. In the city of Salzburg, it is business as usual. In the last 20 years, the Austrian people have witnessed German, Italian, Russian, French, British, and American troops on their soil. Living under a foreign occupation has become the normal way of life. An Austrian housewife shops for her dinner as she has done every day for many years. This is the old world. The impersonal supermarket has not yet taken over from the friendly grocer. And today, perhaps she shops with greater care, for there will be guests for dinner old friends from the American occupation, an army soldier and his wife and child. Tomorrow, they'll be leaving. The Americans are coming to spend their last evening in Austria at the home of this Austrian family, where they have spent so many pleasant evenings in the past. The American soldier and his wife could be spending their last night enjoying the gay cafe life in Salzburg. But somehow it seems more fitting to be here with these people who have made them feel at home so many miles away from home. As the Austrian housewife accomplishes the last minute dinner chores, her husband reminisces about the past. You weren't among them. But I remember when the Americans first came to Austria. The Russians came too. It seemed a happy time. For Austria, the war was over. We could begin to erase the scars of battle, take down the war-torn buildings to make way for the new. We could begin to build once more for the future. told that we would be treated as a liberated country and not a conquered enemy. But soon we found our land divided up into zones of occupation that every day grew more and more permanent in nature. Whenever I think about it, I am thankful that I live in the American zone. I remember the Marshall Plan and MSA. I remember how you helped us to rebuild our country our industry and our power systems. Your people spent a great deal of their money helping us. We won't forget it. Without your help, these factories would have had a difficult time getting started again. These men would not have had these jobs. We know that you tried to bring the occupation to an end many times. You and the French and the British. It was always the Russians who refused. Yes, the Russians were the worst. 
For them, the occupation meant only payment of reparations. Almost all of the usable machinery in the Soviet zone was dismantled and shipped back to Russia to strengthen their economy and weaken ours. Vienna, our capital, was in the Russian zone of occupation. It was treated just like Berlin, cut up among the Allies with a very hot and international zone, administered by all occupying powers, British, French, Russian, and American together. I remember when I was in Vienna, I saw the occupation machinery at work. It all seemed very harmonious to the casual onlooker. The cooperation between the West and Russia was almost too perfect. But my friends in Vienna tell me that underneath it all, there were certain tensions. Spying and counter-spying, for instance, was a pretty common activity. We are not unhappy that Vienna is no longer the headquarters for foreign military operations. I was in Vienna again when the Soviets transferred command of the patrol over to the Americans for the last time. This change of command has been going on now for 10 years. It was a common occurrence. Yet, this particular ceremony was watched with more than average interest. This was the last time the command would change over to foreign hands. The next police in Vienna would be Austrian. The American MP officer performed this last inspection with the usual snap and smartness. We Austrians felt glad. This was the last time the Russian military band would march with such pomp and show. This was the last time that Russian troops would strut through Kaiser Franz Josef Plaza. But it was also the last time that the Americans would be in Vienna, too. We are never happy to have foreign troops on our soil. Yet, in a way, we would be sorry to see you go. We have made many friends among the soldiers of your army. You have been with us over 10 years. We have learned to understand one another. I hope that you will remain our good friends and that some of you will come back and visit us one day. As the families enjoy their meal, the American soldier describes the evacuation procedure. Out at Camp Roeder, we've been working overtime, getting ready for the big move to Italy. Cosmoline. It's a lot easier to put on than it is to take off, as any soldier can tell you. But it protects the weapon, and that's most important, especially when you are shipping them by the thousands. A lot of us had been in Austria a long time. You collect things when you settle down, and all these personal possessions had to be packed up and shipped to new stations wherever they were. This little lady made very sure that her possessions were packed properly. I've never seen so many tanks as I did at the Camp Rotor railhead last week. When armor is concentrated for transport, you begin to realize the terrific firepower that a modern army is capable of. Loading up a line of flat cars like this was as easy for those tankers as parking the family car is for you or me. These tanks had to be tied down good. They were going over the Alps and there's a lot of hairpin curves between here and the end of the line. Meanwhile, around the camp itself, the last signs of U.S. Army occupation were removed. A lot of familiar places to a lot of American soldiers were packed up and shipped to new stations. I remember the last retreat parade we held out at Roeder. Both men and units received many honors.
Lottery, an award medal was presented to one of the sergeants. Then we passed in review for the last time on Austrian soil. It was kind of sad to see the old regimental colors being folded up for shipment to Camp Darby, Italy. Then old Glory herself was rolled up for casing. I guess she'll miss Austria too. Now things really began to move. Everybody had to go through final processing before they could clear the post. Medical check, currency exchange, and customs inspection. Oh, we got the works. At the Postamt, or railroad station, it was women and children first. I've got leave coming, so we didn't have to separate here like a lot of families. Actually, it was only for a few days, so pretty much of a picnic atmosphere prevailed. This train is headed for Vicenza, Italy, and new experiences for all these army families. A little later, a little wetter, and dressed in fatigues, the combat-ready troops of the 350th Infantry Division boarded the train that would take them to their next station, the newly formed CTAF Command. CTAF, the Southern European Task Force, is set up as a hard-hitting retaliatory force in case of aggression on Europe's southern flank. But at the time, the guys were just thinking about saying Auf Wiedersehen to Austria and maybe clowning around a bit. The task of moving the American army out of Austria was too much for the railroads alone. Truck drivers were briefed before a huge map showing the routes of exit. For many men and much of the equipment was moved out by truck. Since early yesterday morning, they've been moving out convoy after convoy, out the MP gate at Rotor, down the Autobahn, across the Brenner Pass and into Italy, everything moved out. And just today, the newly formed Austrian army took over Camp Roder. I was there this afternoon. The place looked like a ghost town. But believe me, you have some wonderful facilities there to get your army off to a good start so that it can soon stand side by side with other free nations in the defense of Europe. And so the Austrian and American friends drink a toast to their continued friendship. And as the Americans take their leave, both families feel sure that this friendship will continue, not just between them as individuals, but as nations too. Now, a couple of Austria's newest soldiers head for the barracks just vacated by the American army. They check the bulletin board to find out just where their new home will be. And like new soldiers everywhere, they begin to get acquainted with this military way of life. They will have a bold new course to set, for they will be part of the first army Austria has had since Adolf Hitler took over the country in 1938.
Here, the Austrian people celebrate the first public display of the new army. All of Vienna is out to cheer this strong symbol of their new independence. As the troops pass President Kerner and Chancellor Raab and other governmental dignitaries in the reviewing stand, the pride of the Austrian people shows on the faces of the spectators. For the first time in almost 20 years, Austria is a sovereign nation. And so today, Austria stands as an independent nation. It is certain that the Austrian people will remember us as friends and that this friendship will become the basis for a growing rapport between our two freedom-loving countries. But now let's turn our big picture cameras back home to the nation's capital, where a group of army mess cooks are getting a few pointers from some of the best chefs in town. People come to Washington for all sorts of reasons. Statesmen, politicians, legislators, and tourists all have their own special reasons. When they are here, they usually stay in one of the many fine hotels that are situated all over the city. And one thing they are sure to get is fine food, prepared by expert chefs and served with mouth-watering appeal. And that's why these Army mess sergeants have come to Washington to learn the art of attractive food service from those master artists, the hotel chefs. Trading their khakis for kitchen fatigue, chef style, this trio of army mess sergeants gets right down to work. Now army chow is some of the best in the world, but in a congested mess hall, the eye appeal of each individual serving tends to take second place. Efficiency is calculated on the number of mouths fed per minute. Without slowing down production, your army is now going to try and make each dish as attractive to the eye as it is nourishing to the stomach. Let's take a look at salads first. This lady is an expert with the greenery and all the other good things that go along to make up such mouth-watering morsels like this. You could take a tip from her, Sergeant. Next, let's cut in on the carving session. How do you like your roast? Sliced nice and thin and even all across? Here's the expert. Now, Sergeant, you try your hand. Now more familiar with hotel technique of service, the mess sergeants near the end of their course. Final examination for the trio comes with the actual preparation and service of a main course platter. Just a soup con of sauce and a pinch of parsley and our platter is ready. Now wouldn't that palpitate your palate? Looks like this sergeant rates an A+. Here's that final exam on its way to the lucky customer. When these three graduate chefs get back to their posts, believe me, soldier, there will be a touch of glamour in KP. It's a long way from the fine hotels of Washington to the steaming jungles of the Panama Canal Zone. But down there is the next place we are going to visit, the Jungle Warfare Training Center. It is far away from everything, on purpose, for its mission is to train American soldiers to live and fight in the toughest tropical terrain found anywhere in the world. This is Operation Jungle Jim. That's jungle down there. The Jungle Warfare Training Center of the United States Army, located on the Chargers River in the Panama Canal Zone. The helicopter pilot drops us off at the Battery McKenzie landing site. We're going to get off here to see just what's going on and what.
Established in 1953, the Jungle Warfare Training Center, the JWTC, occupies an irregular plot of land on the Atlantic side of the isthmus. The terrain includes every kind of tropical growth likely to be encountered by the United States Armed Forces anywhere in the world. These jungle warfare students are learning how to make themselves comfortable. Using only materials generally found in the tropics, they make a shelter for themselves. Stakes lashed together with a tough vine make a raised sleeping platform, Robinson Crusoe style. A roof of ponchos covered with palm fronds and you're all set for a nap. But there's no time for napping here, for next comes the most important course of all, jungle navigation. It is here that you learn to make your way from one place in the jungle to another. Here in the bleachers, you get the fundamentals, the hows and whys and what's to do. Soon enough, you get the practical experience. These are your tools, machetes, axes, brush hooks, and two-man saws. If it sounds like simple equipment, it is. The hard part comes when you put it all to work. This is jungle navigation, trail breaking through tropical forest and swamp land. The vegetation is so thick that you can't make a move without a machete. Axes and saws and shovels come in for a workout too. When the trail is completed, the job is only half done because there's going to be a helicopter landing site right here at the end of the trail. More jungle comes crashing down. It's so hot and humid that you break into a sweat just breathing. At a time like this, there is nothing quite like a slug of old H2O. This man is stripping the bark off of a big tree. The white underside will make a marker that will be visible to the helicopter pilot hundreds of feet in the air. Laid out in the form of the T at the center of the landing site, this is the only runway he will get. With their ability to land almost anywhere, like this, the helicopter has put a third dimension into jungle warfare. Now, instead of going through, it's often quicker and easier to go over. But as of right now, large numbers of men and their equipment must still move over the Earth's surface. And because movement through the jungle is so confined, mines and booby traps have become most effective weapons. Their use is but another course given here at the Jungle Warfare Training Center. Now, members of the class practice booby trapping an aggressor trail. Vegetation is so lush and growth so rapid that mines and traps can easily be camouflaged. Mother Nature will quickly cover up any marks left by man. Any aggressor attempting to use this trail would find his movement slow and dangerous. Here, the students have marked out an anti-tank minefield. The white tape will stay up until the whole area has been mined and a notation to that effect been made on everybody's map. In the jungle, if you can't get around in the air, the next best bet is the water. A couple of students start off on a stream reconnaissance problem. The rest of the class follows along next in line, while the instructor keeps track of three or four classes at once with a power boat. When the soldier has successfully completed jungle navigation, both on land and water, 
He is ready for instruction in small unit tactics. In the half-light of the jungle floor, camouflage is particularly effective. These men are from the 11th Airborne Division. In May and June of 1955, they came here to participate in a five-week jungle training exercise. Exercise Jungle Gym. Many officers from friendly foreign nations came also as observers. This is the objective, a small strip of land on the Atlantic coast. At the center is an unimpressive looking hill, but it commands the overland approaches to the aggressor main base. Umpires watch as the aggressor personnel take up their defensive positions. Having just hacked their way through the jungle, friendly forces assault their objective in a rush. Exercise Jungle Gym comes to an end, but the Jungle Warfare Training Center continues to produce jungle-wise soldiers for your army for any emergency. The Austrian evacuation, the Cook's tour of Washington, and Operation Jungle Jim. Diverse incidents in the life of your army, yet all related to one mission, the defense of freedom. This is Sergeant Stuart Queen, inviting you to be with us again next week for another look at your army in action on the big picture. The Big Picture is a weekly television report to the nation on the activities of the Army at home and overseas. Produced by the Signal Corps Pictorial Center. Presented by the United States Army in cooperation with this station. You too can be an important part of the Big Picture. You can proudly serve with the best equipped, the best trained, the best fighting team in the world today, the United States Army.